Good morning. My name is Tim Stewart. I am president at Visual Decisions. And we are here today to talk about how to create an evergreen FMEA with Industry 4.0. At Visual Decisions, we've been in the business of utilizing information from the shop floor to improve continuous improvement since about 2002. We help our customers combine the smart factory with the lean factory to drive improvements to cost, throughput, and quality. Our customers have seen dramatic improvements such as 30% increases in OEE, 50% scrap reductions, and much more. Uh, just like wearing a Fitbit won't automatically make you thin, implementing technology for Industry 4.0 won't automatically make the business better. The culture of the organization and the business processes have to be adapted to take advantage of the new capabilities to drive real improvements. That is why we have a unique approach to work with our customers to adapt processes to take advantage of the new capabilities and help establish a true data-driven manufacturing culture. As a quick procedural note, if you have questions during the presentation, please enter them into the Q&A. I'll get to them at the end of the webinar. Thank you. So the goal for today is this. How can we make the FMEA process easier to perform, more accurate, more comprehensive, with more context, and an evergreen ongoing part of the daily management process? To get started, we'll take a quick look at the traditional FMEA process. A failure mode and effect analysis is a detailed quality process that lists out potential failure modes, the effects and causes of those failures, and then calculates the overall risk with those failures. The team then attempts to find ways to mitigate the effects, eliminate the occurrences, or improve the probability of detection. FMEA techniques have been around for over 50 years. It gained wide, widespread adoption thanks to the automotive industry and the QS 9000 supplier requirements. The standard requires suppliers to conduct product uh, or design and process FMEAs in an effort to eliminate failures before they happen. An FMEA can provide significant savings for a company by improving throughput and by reducing uh, the internal cost of quality as well as external warranty and other uh, quality related expenses. While an FMEA can be performed on a product or on a process, the principles and the steps are very much the same. Uh, the objective for a product or design FMEA is to uncover problems with the product that will result in safety hazards, product malfunctions, or shortened product life. Uh, process FMEAs uncover problems related to the manufacturer of a product. And that's really going to be our primary focus for today. I've worked with different customers who use slightly different uh, process approaches for FMEAs. There are also standards defined by very, uh, various governing bodies. However, they all have certain things in common. Uh, for a process FMEA, it is necessary to define three things up front. Uh, first of all, you have to define the team. Usually this is a group of four to six people that have some level of knowledge of the manufacturing process and expertise in diagnosing failure modes and their effects and causes. Uh, the scope, uh, what process will the team be investigating? What are the beginning and the end points? And then the process map. Uh, once the scope is determined, the you know, individual process steps should be defined prior to the event. Once you're in the event itself, the FMEA usually proceeds by listing out the following for each one of those different steps. What is the function or purpose of each step? Uh, what is the complete set of failure modes? Uh, so how can that step the process fail to achieve its purpose? Uh, what are the complete set of effects for each of those failure modes? And there can be more than one uh, effect. Uh, what is the severity of that effect? How much will that effect impact safety, product quality, throughput, et cetera? Uh, what is the complete set of potential causes for each failure mode? And there can definitely be more than one of those for each failure mode. Uh, what is the potential prevention methods or what are the potential preve prevention methods for that cause? Um, how likely is that cause to occur? 
Uh, what are the detection methods that exist for that cause? Um, what is the probability of detecting that cause when it does occur? What is the risk management plan? This can include ways to either mitigate the effect of the failure, to eliminate occurrences of the cause, or to raise the probability of detection when it does happen. So this entire process is usually a long time consuming process for the entire team. Uh, it often takes a full week or more of time to complete a thorough FMEA on a decent sized process. Unfortunately, once they're completed, they're rarely kept up to date, uh, probably because there's so much work to do. Uh, once the initial set of actions are completed, the FMEA will often uh, sit in a drawer or, you know, on a hard drive only to be pulled out during audits or other major calamities. So how can Industry 4.0 help make the FMEA process easier, more valuable, or both? And it's worth taking a second here to discuss the uh, kind of great manual versus digital debate that sometimes takes place within lean manufacturing implementations. While I often hear an objection about why a manual approach is better for things like visual controls or Kaizen projects or value stream mapping, I actually rarely hear that objection for FMEAs. Perhaps because it is because the FMEA is such a painful process. Uh, if you would like me to get into a deeper discussion about this topic, please let me know in the Q&A. So first of all, what exactly is Industry 4.0? Uh, Industry 4.0 encompasses a lot of different technologies. The graphic on the right is a visual from the World Economic Forum that is a comprehensive look at technologies that are considered to be part of Industry 4.0. At the center are some of the mainstream technologies, then the maturing and emerging technologies are in the outer rings. It, also has different categories uh, such as advanced materials, production philosophies, analytics, and intelligence, and so forth. As you can see, there are a wide number of different technologies that are part of Industry 4.0. Um, a few of the most relevant for this topic are advanced analytics, uh, the Industrial Internet of Things, or IIoT, uh, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. Uh, these technologies are very applicable to improving the FMEA process. So where can we best apply these technologies? Um, going back to the list of FMEA steps, uh, the following stand out as potential areas where various solutions can provide value. Uh, first of all, generating and maintaining the list of failure modes, effects, and causes. Uh, generating and maintaining the ratings for the severity, the occurrence probability, and the uh, detection probability. And then expanding the solution space of potential actions as well. And I'll get into more details in the next few slides. Let's walk through an example of how we can get some of the information for our FMEA from our systems. We start with a simple FMEA worksheet. Uh, this example just uses the basic columns. Let's highlight the columns for the lists. Uh, the columns for the failure modes and the causes are highlighted now. Uh, so where would this information exist in our current or future solutions? Uh, one source of information that uh, there could be out there is from the PLC controllers for the machines. Uh, from the controller, we can get a lot of information. We can trap fault codes that tell us the particular failure mode experienced by the machine. Uh, we can also track input or process variables that help us manually or automatically diagnose which causal factors were underlying the uh, current event. Uh, we can also track downtime, rejects, failed tests, and so forth to trap the particular effect of this event. Uh, alternatively, we could also get the operator uh, to enter you know, failure modes or even their estimates at the causal level. Uh, the PLC screen shown here allows for that type of operator input, and we'll see a more detailed example later in these slides. Also, when a new failure mode effect or causal is identified, it should be added to the list in the data collection, and the list within the FMEA should automatically be updated with that information. 
Ultimately, by tracking this information in our shop floor systems on a 24 by seven basis, we can then feed this information back into the FMEA as updates to the lists, as well as to the severity, occurrence, and detection risk numbers. Uh, this keeps the analysis up to date with the process and also allows tracking of the real-time impact of the failure modes and causes over time. And you can also see how those are trending and getting better, getting worse, et cetera. So our next step is to look at where we get the data for the analysis. As we'll see, there's usually a massive amount of information out there already. It's a matter of accessing and analyzing it. To show just how much data is available, let's walk through an example first. At one of our bakery customers, we were initially told that they didn't have much data available for the project. When we walked the shop floor with the customer, we tracked how much data they were currently tracking. Much of it was in Access or Excel or currently locked away in the PLCs, but it was there. Uh, just a few examples, uh, data from receiving inspection, from uh, inventory, they tracked ingredient dispensing by lot to meet the Food Safety Modernization Act, and mixing and dividing, the machine controller captured the process time and many different process variables. They also had a checkware. Uh, they had a standalone SPC system in use at this station and others. At proofing and baking, they captured process variables such as the oven temperature, conveyor speed, and more. At final inspection, they had a vision system that checked the color and other factors of the bread. At shipping, they had another check wire and tracked information about uh, production against the work order. Uh, throughout the entire process, they used spread, uh, spreadsheets to track non-conformances, scrap, and downtime issues. So, we worked with the customer to pull the information from the existing systems and to create quick web forms on top of the SQL database to replace the spreadsheets. And I'll get into this example a little bit more in a couple more slides. So when you look at the entire uh, you know, shop floor and uh, the different systems that we could pull information from, it's hard to give a definitive list of different systems where we can source the information that we'll need. Unfortunately for this conversation, it varies with every customer. And I know I'm a consultant and that's what consultants say, but it actually is true in this case. Uh, different companies have different systems implemented in different ways. Uh, but there are a number of standard systems where we can look for the data. Uh, the list on the screen is not meant to be comprehensive, uh, but these are very common places where we can start uh, to look for the data that we can use in the process. Uh, Industrial Internet of Things, useful to access raw PLC data, MES and historian systems, uh, quality systems, supply chain systems, ERP, uh, employee time tracking systems like Kronos, um, RFID tracking. And you know, for these different systems, high level data such as scrap, rework costs and so forth can be found in the ERP systems. And you know these exist in just about every company we work with. Uh, the ERP system can also be used to apply uh, business context, such as costing to data we collect from other sources, and that helps us track severity and so forth. Uh, but the details of the process usually have to be found elsewhere. Uh, MES systems and data historians can contain massive amounts of data that can be extremely helpful in this process. Uh, depending on the industry and the process undergoing the FMEA, and the individual company and how they've implemented their MES, these may be sufficient or nearly sufficient in themselves. Um, however, for other companies, Industry 4.0 systems can take this information to another level of detail. Uh, Industry 4.0 systems such as IIoT, uh, the Industrial Internet of Things, uh, can capture and provide information at pretty much any level of detail useful to the analysis. Uh, they're also almost infinitely flexible to fill any gap in current uh, systems uh, for that those systems may have in the current data collection process. Uh, just as an example, additional sensors can be used in the process to detect causal factors that were previously impossible to capture. Uh, you might use vibration sensors or sound sensors or something like that. Um, another note with IIoT and sensors, 
Uh, for many companies such as machine builders, this is an opportunity to build these capabilities into their own products that they ship to customers. Then they can have a live uh, product uh, FMEA uh, with their own products in the field based on the telematics that they receive back from usage. Um, getting back to the process FMEA, uh, additional systems such as time systems or RFID can help provide additional contextual information to the analysis. And there are many, many additional sources of potential data as we'll see in the next section, highlighting quality. So when looking at different systems that can be used to provide the data, there's usually a large number of systems at each company that contains some form of quality data. Uh, just as an example, we worked with a firearms manufacturer that asked us to provide a con consolidated view of quality data across their facilities within their plants, they actually had 57 different systems that contained quality data. And it was nearly impossible for any single person at the company to know about all of those systems, let alone actually use them as part of an ongoing analysis. And so what we did was we helped provide that consolidated view, uh, pulling information from the different systems and making it accessible in a single place. The next step is to focus on what type of information we can capture from the process. Uh, one key is to collect information beyond simple performance data. Instead of looking at a metric such as first pass yield, uh, it's important to know what is driving the rejects. Without that information, you can tell if things are getting better or getting worse, but you won't know why. And for the FMEA process, it's really the whys that are absolutely critical to know. So once you start to collect it, there are many ways to organize that diagnostic data. Uh, one way is to do it uh, in a fishbone or Ishikawa diagram. Uh, th this can also be done through Pareto diagrams with drill downs, uh, tree map diagrams, and many more. Uh, the key is that you want to have that structure defined as you are capturing information from the process. Uh, then it will be available for the analysis that you want to do later. And so there are several approaches to this categorization. Uh, one is to have the operators enter the information when events occur on the shop floor. Another is to capture fault codes directly from the PLCs and other data from the machine and defining a map from those codes to the diagnostic categories. And another way is to utilize machine learning capabilities to automatically categorize uh, the information. And we'll touch on this in a few more slides. So going back to the bakery that we referenced earlier, um, at this particular plant, uh, they were already collecting data about some downtime and material losses, um, but information was going into a database with no easy way to work with the information to make improvements. So we combined automated data collection from the PLCs uh, with data input by the operators to categorize uh, downtime and quality events. We then designed a process where the team would be able to compare performance between the lines and shifts, identify trends, and compare the performance of the current period to past periods. Uh, we helped design the team meeting to quickly identify where the previous shift had issues and create focus on uh, getting those issues addressed as rapidly as possible. We worked with the company to uh, create standard work to drive consistency from shift to shift in how they performed. And with this tool, we were able to measure our progress in that effort. So where we really started to make big gains with this was when we stepped down to another level of detail. Uh, so for every instance of downtime or quality issues, we started using the system to track the area of the issue, the category of the problem and the cause. And this was really uh, tying into essentially the you know, individual function, uh, the failure mode, and then the cause for that failure mode. And so we tried our best to align this with, you know, what was happening within uh, the FMEA process that, you know, the customer had performed. And so uh, we then trained the continuous improvement team to use the tool to identify where the plant's biggest issues were happening. And with this solution in just a couple of clicks, we were able to identify those big issues. Uh, so in this example, we clicked on the biggest problem area of equipment loss. Uh, then we clicked on the biggest category of oven. 
And uh, then the trend chart, uh, chart shows, uh, well, and the causes, uh, there were several different things like load conveyor and loader and so forth. But one of them that wasn't captured, you know, they were clicking on other. And so for anything that they were entering as other, we asked them to put in comments so that we could then add those back into the, uh, you know, different list of causes and the failure modes and effects analysis, as well as uh, start to track those individually. And so as we looked at this information, what we found was that uh, these big spikes that were happening in the downtime uh, were being caused by uh, broken pins um, on the oven shelves as they were going, as the conveyor was going through uh, the oven. And uh, by knowing that uh, we had these big spikes, but normally it was very low, we could see that we had to prevent a maintenance issue here. And so just after a little bit more digging, we identified uh, what was the period in which we needed to, you know, rotate those, uh, not rotate, but uh, replace those conveyor pins and so forth because of the fatiguing that was taking place. And we were basically able to eliminate the biggest single source of downtime that they were having. And so as we saw in an earlier slide, because we have these categorized in a similar way to what we have in the FMEA analysis, we were able to feed this back into that analysis to highlight the different failure modes, the causes, and the effects that we were seeing from those issues. I mentioned the fact that we can utilize machine learning and artificial intelligence to um, automatically classify some of these things. Uh, so amongst the uh, many uses for machine learning is to improve the probability of detection. So if we think about um, how we're actually seeing these different issues, uh, sometimes we can't directly detect uh, the particular cause that's happening. But if we look kind of indirectly at some of the other process variables or inputs, uh, we can actually identify that those are correlated to uh, that uh, particular failure cause. And by utilizing the machine intelligence, we can identify uh, you know, what else we can look at in order to detect uh, when that uh, causal is actually happening. Uh, another key application is to automatically classify events into different causal and failure categories so that we don't have to have operators uh, do that or so that they can you know, just be a check on what the algorithm is actually reporting. Um, another big impact of Industry 4.0 is to broaden the solution space. Uh, for many problems in manufacturing, the fix will be uh, some alteration to the physical equipment involved. Uh, going back to the fishbone diagram, uh, these fixes primarily relate to the machine branch of uh, the fishbone. However, when the problem is related to uh, man, material, method, management, or even environmental, uh, the fix is often process or system based. And uh, for many of those issues, the technologies of Industry 4.0 can provide tremendous benefits. So, the next area that I want to uh, touch on is the FMEA as a living document. So that's the idea of, you know, how do we make this evergreen uh, so that the FMEA isn't a one-time project that we do, uh, but it's something that continues to uh, be live and uh, updated. So the biggest piece of that, as I've uh, touched on in many places, is uh, being able to collect information from those different sources and then utilize that to update our uh, FMEA analysis. And this is where uh, the traditional approach is that it's a project and you might go to these source systems, uh, but you'll, you're going to pull the information from those source systems, you're going to put it into Excel or something else, and then you'll uh, do an analysis from the team to figure out, you know, what is, what are the different, uh, you know, risks, uh, risk numbers that I'm putting on the different categories here. And instead of taking that approach, what we can do is have these systems tied into the live application itself. And in order to do this, we have to find some way of taking that information from those source systems and either performing the calculation automatically or uh, being able to show that in such a way that we can periodically uh, weekly, monthly, whatever it might be, uh, do a review of that information to update the information within uh, the FMEA application. 
And so uh, being able to have this live tie is extremely critical. Uh, the other thing that is even perhaps more important is that there has to be two-way communication between these systems that are capturing the reasons and uh, the FMEA application itself. I've been into, I don't know how many customers where they've done an FMEA on the process and they do data collection for downtime events and quality events and so forth, but they haven't aligned uh, the uh, structures and the categories of those different events between those different analyses. And so you can't use one to update the other. Uh, if you want to have the FMA being an ongoing, live, updated, evergreen system, you have to make sure that you're using that same categorization between the different uh, analyses. So how do we actually build this FMEA application or does it already exist somewhere? And so uh, given the number of possible outputs and data sources and goals for improvement, there's no real single recommendation on which approach to use. Um, I'll cover a few in this section that we've seen successful with our customers. And the first one is to use a purpose-built lean solution. And uh, these types of systems are, you know, specifically designed for FMA analysis and have uh, many, if not, you know, most of the uh, desired, you know, formats and so forth built into the software, uh, depending on what standards your company uses and so forth. Uh, there are several such packages in the market, and it's outside of the scope of this presentation to get into the details of one system versus another. Uh, but one of the key factors to consider when looking at those systems is how easy is it to feed information uh, into and out of the solution. And you know, depending on how you want to automate the criteria for assessing the RPN factors, that, you know, that part of it could be important. But it is critical to be able to keep the failure modes and causes there in sync with the data collection systems on the shop floor. And you don't want that to be a manual process if you can avoid it. Uh, the business intelligence systems uh, is our next option. And those are systems such as Power BI, Tableau, or Click. And those systems are very, very good at taking fragmented information across disparate uh, sources, consolidating that information together, and then providing a cohesive uh, view of that data. And those systems you know, provide for ongoing data collection from those different source systems. Uh, the downside with those tools is that none of them have the FMEA format pre-configured. Uh, it has to be done as part of an initial implementation. However, once that initial process has been completed, the system should be reasonably easy to modify and maintain going forward. Uh, the next solution in the list is an internet of or industrial Internet of Things uh, platform. Uh, those solutions have similar advantages and disadvantages to the BI um, options with a couple of key exceptions. Uh, the first is when a data source does not exist in the BI approach, some other system must be implemented to perform that data collection. Uh, when using an IIoT approach, that system itself can plug practically any data collection gap that you have. Uh, in addition, that IoT system can act as a hub for data on the shop floor to persist data and also integrate uh, systems where necessary. Where the IoT systems typically fall a bit short is the analysis of historical information. They're great at information currently coming from the shop floor or within you know, the recent history, but if you look back a year for how you know, failure events have trended and so forth, well, that's going to be much better um, done in a BI system. So what some of our customers have uh, utilized is a blended approach between those two systems and a very successful hybrid application. Um, the final approach that we have seen with our customers is the custom software approach where everything is built from scratch. Some of the customers we've worked with have uh, really solid uh, capabilities within their IT departments. A few of those customers had already put custom solutions in place for data collection. And in those cases, it made sense for them to continue that development to add these visualizations and workflows in place on top of that existing code base. The final step is to standardize the solution. And I cannot emphasize enough the role of standard work here. 
when we think about standard work in manufacturing, the first thing that pops into our minds is getting all the operators to work with the equipment in the same way every time. And that's absolutely a part of the solution to many problems. Uh, but we also have to think about the leader standard work, setting the culture and making a solution part of the process means having the team leaders, supervisors and value stream managers and executives all be a part of the solution. Just as an example uh, where event categorization categorization is being done partially or entirely by the operators, it's critical that standard work be built up around that process. The operators have to have the standard work to assign uh, failure modes and causes when events occur. Uh, maintenance, uh, when they come by, uh, the machine should have standard work to update uh, those failure modes and causes when they work on a machine. Um, the supervisors should have standard work to review what's being reported throughout the day and plant leadership should be reviewing that data on a daily and weekly basis as well. Um, we've seen operator input be very comprehensive and accurate means of tracking information on the shop floor, but really it only works when the review and use of that information is uh, deeply embedded into the culture of the organization through standard work. So now I'll talk about some lessons learned as we've uh, gone through this process with our customers. Uh, the first thing that we run into is, you know, what is the best time to gather data? And, you know, as the saying goes, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. Um, the next best time is right now. And the same thing is true for data. Uh, the best time to collect data is before you need it. Uh, the next best time is to start collecting it right now. So when you're kicking off any improvement project or you know, an FME process uh, that you want to be evergreen and so forth, uh, the desire is to already have the data to do the analysis. Um, then there's no need to spend you know, weeks collecting that data and so forth. Um, but as discussed earlier, uh, that also means that the data is, if you start collecting it in the past, uh, the data is likely to be higher quality, less biased, and much more plentiful. Uh, what data should be gathered? Um, I kind of just with the everything bagels here, um, but in an ideal world, uh, data collection and storage would be free. And in that case, everything really would be the answer. Um, in the real world, we have to be a bit more focused. So the first question to answer is really, where should data be gathered? And in general, there are a lot of ways to answer this question, but I'll focus on two scenarios. The first is if a process is out of control or you have critical processes to the uh, facility. And in each of these scenarios, you should be definitely putting together a data collection plan for those processes. So once you've decided where you want to collect the data, then you can uh, you know, look at it, uh, your FMEA process that you would want to run on those and think through, you know, what is the data that you would want to have uh, about potential causal factors and everything else? Um, what is the data that you can collect um, about that? And what would you like to have? What are the gaps? And so then put plans in place to, you know, collect and analyze the information or to uh, close the gaps that, you know, do exist. Uh, put control plans in place to monitor those factors for uh, signals of issues and use alerting to notify people when you know control limits are exceeded and so forth. And none of these analyses will provide any value if the information feeding them is garbage. Uh, so part of the implementation plan for data collection should be to identify methods to determine when issues exist with the data collection itself. Uh, some of the common issues we've come across are sensors reporting anomalous results. Uh, they could be dirty, faulty, or other reasons. Um, the sensors aren't reporting any data. Uh, they could be broken, network issues, et cetera. Uh, human input issues, uh, as we discussed earlier, uh, building up standard work around this is really the best method of addressing this, but you, know, you could have missing input, uh, lazy input, unit of measure errors, et cetera, and you know, many more different types of uh, data issues. But, um, in our implementations, we strive to anticipate as many of those issues in advance and put controls or alerts in place on that data collection itself uh, to notify people when there are issues with that. 
Uh, so some closing thoughts here. Um, and if you have questions, please get them into the Q&A. Um, so really what we're looking at with this is that you no longer think of an FMEA as a project. There's a project to create the evergreen FMEA in the first place. Uh, but once that FMEA is created, it really isn't a project that begins and ends. It's a project that will continue to bear fruit you know, as you go through time. And it's something that you'll spend more time on up front to get all of this uh, set up and configured, but it's something that will last for years within the organization. Um, use the FMEA to inform the data collection plan. So you can do it, as we talked about a couple of slides ago, in terms of creating that data collection plan, you can actually do an FMEA first in more of a traditional way and use that to identify where are the places that I have to collect data within that critical process. Um, you know, tracking the success of actions. And so do you, um, you know, as you perform actions on the shop floor and so forth, as you're uh, running ongoing projects, you can actually look at the impact of that in the uh, FMEA and see how you're reducing the RPN uh, for those different failure modes. Um, so restructuring the FMEA project approach, as I've kind of highlighted several times here, um, no longer is it really a project. It's something that you have a project up front, uh, but this is an ongoing uh, thing where now I want to embed this into my you know, ongoing uh, standard work uh, that I utilize within all of my different departments. And then uh, the industrial internet of things, especially uh, with the product and design FMEAs where, uh, for instance, if you're a machine builder and you're shipping your product out to the field, being able to embed uh, the additional sensors and the you know, software into those products uh, to be able to, you know, get those telematics, get that usage information back in uh, from all of your different customers so that you can utilize that to identify, you know, additional failure modes, additional, uh, you know, what is my probability of occurrence of these different things uh, is tremendously uh, impactful in terms of designing the next iteration of that project or product. So I do have one question in the Q&A and it's how do you assess that there's even a need for an FMEA? Um, is a square one or you know, other QC tools are used? Um, you know, it goes back to um, really a cost basis. Um, everything should be driven based on you know, what kind of an impact is this going to have for the organization? So if you have, uh, you know, if you're utilizing whatever tools to determine, uh, you know, where do you have significant costs for the organization uh, that are unnecessary, that are higher than expected, that have a high degree of variation and so forth. Uh, those are the places where I would prioritize uh, looking at uh, putting the FME in place. Um, also, if I have, you know, critical products or obviously if I'm in automotive and I have uh, production units I'm shipping out to a customer, uh, then I actually have to do an FMEA for those uh, products and customers and processes. Anything else? All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for attending. Um, I should have a video of the presentation up on uh, my website within a uh, day or two, as well as a downloadable copy of the presentation. Uh, so I'll uh, send out an email as a follow up to everyone to let you know when that is available. Uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to talking with you all in the future. Bye.